Welcome, dear colleagues, to one more debate in the Activist Museum series, a uh, rather urgent debate, uh, since uh, it seems that our sector, not just the museum sector, but also the cultural sector, has become much more aware, if we weren't before, of the political pressure and interferes on cultural organizations in Europe and beyond. Um, Last week, NEMO, the Network of European Museum Organizations, issued a statement uh, called Museums Under Pressure. Uh, the European Theatre Convention also made a statement regarding uh, the pressure and the cancellation of uh, artistic works in different countries. So it is, it is urgent that we talk or talk again. Uh, we thank very much the three colleagues who accepted the invitation to be with us today, and I'll present them briefly. Their bio notes are on our, our website, so you can easily find them. Uh, we have with us, uh, I'll start the way you appear on my screen, uh, Goranka Horian. Uh, Goranka is the director of the Dvor Trakoschan Museum in Croatia, but also the chair of Intercom, the uh, ICOM International Committee for Museum Management. We have Julia Lesser, who's a political scientist at uh, Humboldt University in Berlin. She was the coordinator or one of the coordinators of chapter, uh, and the acronym means Challenging Populist Truth Making in Europe, the role of museums in a digital post-truth European society. And we also have with us Jana Golombek, a researcher and senior curator at the Industrial Museum in Solen, Dortmund. Uh, so thank you very much for accepting our invitation. We'll have a um, conversation between the four of us to start with, and then all the colleagues who are here with us today uh, may intervene uh, live or in writing, whatever you feel more comfortable with. So perhaps I'll start with Jana with a very specific case. Um, Jana, we read that uh, the exhibition, This is Colonial, provoked um, rather hostile reactions. Um, and we would be interested to know how was this hostility expressed and how yourself and the museum dealt with it. Okay, um, maybe I'm gonna give a little bit of context first about Please. the exhibition, just very briefly. Um, and also about a museum, because um, we are an industrial museum that was founded in 1979 and we were coming from a tradition of history from below movement. So we are always interested not in the technical aspects of the industries or of the different branches of industries um, that we are presenting with our eight different sites um, of the museum. Um, but we wanted to tell the history of the workers, male and female, um, in their original places, like um, in their authentic places. So that is where we came from and we have always been practicing um, kind of um, critical heritage approach um, already starting at the beginning of the 80s with oral history interviews and different um, formats that we um, tried and um, to establish different exhibitions which were always linked to like actual um, socially relevant topics. Um, so that's basically where we came from and that is also why we we're talking about colonialism or are talking about colonialism because of course it is connected to um, trade and industry as well but um, also to all the aspects of the everyday lives of the workers but of course also today um, so the approach we came from with this exhibition project which was called that's colonial is um, that we wanted to ask uh, what does colonialism have to do with us so we always wanted to start from the present and then have a look at um, the historical connections of the region of Westphalia. Um, and we also knew that we wanted to have like different um, newer approaches to the topic. And um, that is why um, we wanted to have an exhibition workshop first. We call it an exhibition workshop, which is kind of a laboratory to um, get connected to people, to talk uh, about different formats, to establish new perspectives on this topic. Um, and the starting point also was that we were a, a white team, or we are a white team, and we knew that we wanted to have like this um, participatory approach to get a lot of perspectives in that we couldn't, couldn't give. Um, 
And we also wanted to have this format to be able to make mistakes. So that is where we came from. And we wanted to establish this um, or use this format to do this exhibition, which started this year in June. The exhibition workshop was last year from March to October. Um, so we had a few questions that we were working on. So what does colonialism have to do with me as the foundation um, and the crucial question to the whole project? Then what does colonialism have to do with this failure? Um, what, what could a decolonial exhibition practice look like? Um, what should we talk about? Um, what should we learn or unlearn? Um, and who should be on stage? And we had different, we had a recording studio, we had a stage, we had a workspace, a library, and a lot of different elements. Um, and we also had, um, as I said, different formats that we wanted to use. Um, we also had an advisory board, which were very important for our project because um, it was like scientists, activists, artists from the region, also persons of color who were advising us on the project. And we talked about um, the formats we wanted to use and everything with them. And um, we also paid them, which was also a very important aspect because usually um, you don't pay your academic advisory board. And we had a lot of um, discussions with that. And also the project was linked to very many, uh, to many enriched processes within the museum as well. So it's very complex and I'm trying like to, to break it down for this, um, for this talk. And one of the formats was that we, um, wanted to have a safer space every Saturday from um, 10 to 2 p.m. Um, so four hours within a week, we're, you know, every day we are open from 10 to 6. Um, so there's a lot of time to um, to see the exhibition if you can't do this, um, can't use the safer space. And during this period of time, it was requested to, re um, to provide a space for people personally affected by racism offering them uh, protection from further, maybe also including unconscious discrimination. So we just asked other visitors to respect this time slot. Um, and they did for about six months. Um, we didn't control who was going in or not. We just relied on our visitors to, to respect this um, space. Um, we had a lot of positive feedback. Um, we learned a lot during this time of the exhibition workshop. Um, and then at the end of August, our um, yeah, ambitious, challenging, and also very beloved project, um, which we're all very invested in, got disrupted. Um, when three members of the AFD, the German Right Wing Party, um, came to the exhibition and um, filmed secretly within the exhibition workshop, although they were talking in the video about um, the fact that they weren't allowed to enter the exhibition space, but then they filmed within this exhibition space. Um, they rather, um, later deleted that. Um, and then they um, also filmed our employees without them knowing. Um, and they confronted them if it wasn't racism against white people and stuff like that. So um, mm. there was also the narrative they put out there after that. Um, then they left and, and the next days they um, put the video online you know, and set their whole process in motion, starting on TikTok, going on X, and, you know, with all the influences, multiplying um, the effect of this video. Um, yeah, so that was, that started, and it was, um, yeah, it took us a few weeks to deal with this whole thing, um, because we had a lot of um, people calling us, we had to switch to the answering machine, we had thousands, I think, almost 4,000 emails that we received. Um, we had bad Google reviews, everything you can think of. Um, yeah, people were called out on the internet, our employees, they took pictures from a website and, you know, people got attacked like on, um, in the digital space. Um, we ended up in telegram groups in Dortmund um, that were um, calling to action, you know, to boycott the museum and stuff like that. And um, in the first week, I think it was, um, the Monday that the video came out and then um, of course everyone was like a little bit anxious about the, the upcoming Saturday with the next safer space time slot. Um, we had the police involved, um, state security, everything and um, yeah also a lot of people showing solidarity um, and coming on the Saturday um, and basically there was a lot, a lot of press there but um, not so many right-wing activists. We also had someone um, 
before that Saturday, coming to the museum, putting up signs that white people were not allowed to enter the museum and stuff like that. But they caught the one person who did that, but he also, you know, posted that in this telegram telegram groups um, that we also followed to know um, what was going on. So that was the first Saturday and um, we kept up the safer space like um, we said we kept up the safer space, but of course we couldn't guarantee that not other people's were, people were getting in, but um, you know, to not back down, we of course said that we were would keep up the safer space time slot. But of course, we informed all of our cooperation partners um, and everyone working with us that, of course, we couldn't, you know, um, keep up the safer space as a real safer space. It was, um, yeah. So that was for the last yeah. few weeks because, uh, like I said, it was at the end of August, beginning of September, and um, then in the middle of October, the the exhibition workshop ended. So that was, was the last weeks. Um, but it took us a few weeks to deal with it. They had like different methods, of course, uh, everything, you know, um, it's very obvious what they're doing. But of course, we were not well enough prepared. We were prepared somehow. It's not that we didn't expect anything to happen, but maybe not in that scale, because we also get... Um, international attention, um, Washington Post writing about us. So that was like a second wave because when the first one, you know, um, in the beginning we got a lot of bad press or also the um, maybe not right wing press was, um, they had like this clickbait um, headlines. So um, if you, yeah. even if you try to, you know, people who were really unsure what was going on, um, the first thing they saw were those clickbait headlines. Um, and maybe the article hidden behind a paywall so that they couldn't really get some information. Mm. And during this whole process, we, of course, had to filter who was maybe still really interested in the project and really wanted to know what was going on and who was just, you know, um, activated by the right wing network to ask stupid questions and to turn around the narrative. Because um, one thing that they, of course, the usual stuff like wasting taxpayers' money and, and things like that, um, but of course, also that we were keeping people from being able to talk with each other about this important topic um, okay. and of course this whole thing was to keep everyone from talking about colonialism and you know distracting everyone from um, the real topic of the exhibition which worked for for a few weeks yeah. the yeah, tactics exactly. sound very familiar by now uh, yeah. in other countries as well in uh, the country where we're based as well in in portugal uh, a quick question before we pass to Julia is um, people who expressed solidarity what means did they use to do it um, they use social media but also um, we have our own social media channel so you're all invited to follow us <laughs> I'm going to put it in the chat later on okay. um, we have our own social media channel for the project because we decided early on that we wanted to be able to contact people um, of course, it's always about resources as well, because we initially we didn't have someone who was only doing our social media, um, but we really, you know, pushed like finances around to, to be able to pay someone to do that. Um, and we also have our own social media channels for the museum, for the different sites. Um, so on our channel, there were we were in this bubble of people already being interested in dealing with colonialism. Um, so that was the easy bubble and the others weren't quite used to the topic. And that's where the negative stuff was happening. Also a lot on Facebook because people are really invested there and uh, really, mm -hmm. you know, um, sticking to this topic. But um, the problem was that we, we weren't able to react immediately because we are as a museum are part of this larger um, regional assembly, um, uh, the Landschaftsverband. Um, which is also the um, the assembly where the AFD members came from, because we have a political organ within that organization. So we, if we want to react, we have to talk to um, to the people above us, um, mm -hmm. and it's very it moved very slow. So we weren't able to put out and to um, explain to our followers what was happening, so nobody could really react. So it took us some time to you know. Um, a few days until we put out a video of um, our director of all the museums 
um, who explained the situation. And then people could react to that. And um, then people started to, um, to comment, to take over discussions within the comments, which we had to do before that so that was um it was a lot on social media that the positive reactions yeah. came in but we also had people coming explicitly to visit the exhibition workshop after that and also to show solidarity so there were much more people um who were showing their solidarity that actually showed up um and the right wing people it was like i think it was three people waiting in front of the museum and not coming in because then they would have had to to pay the entrance fee so Okay. Um, they didn't really come in okay. so a lot of it was on the in the analog and in the digital space that we had this positive positive reactions and we also had very um, a lot of articles um, that gave in-depth reports of the exhibition workshop as well and what what we were doing there really okay. yeah great thank you Jana for sharing um well um maybe I move we move we can move on to you Julia uh this definitely is not new to you. You have been researching these incidents. Uh, what are the main findings of your research and of the chapter project? Um, yes, so um, the, the chapter project, um, it started running in 2021 and it's primarily concerned um, with the impacts of you know, the rise of the right across Europe. Uh, specifically on on museums um, and what we did in the first two years was um, uh, you know a larger interview study in uh, in Poland and the UK and in Germany um, and uh, we did interviews with um, people working in museums uh, also you know different cities and different areas and different types of museums um, um, about their experiences with, uh, you know, these sort of disruptions and interventions. Um, um, and we're seeing that uh, museums basically, with the surge of um, nationalist populist politics, far right politics, uh, museums become a target um, of attacks. Um, they also become a tool for these far-right politics, as we have seen uh, in Poland, where we had a peace government, um, um, so far-right nationalist government until last year, and the changes that happened for museums um, were very drastic. So there was a exchange of um, directors of museums, there were transformations in in the exhibitions and the narratives uh, they promoted. Um, and um, yes, we were interested also as a project um, um, how these, you know, how these transformations occurred in these museums. Um, and the people we spoke to, they described them as, um, you know, happen happening quietly, you know, without any discussion, without, you know, any attention from the media. They were like happening um without also the, the team discussing and of course um you know with these um firings of directors also happening with this you know very much um, attention from the media also from international media people were of course also very afraid of losing their jobs and um so we you know we we we, we had this and we looked at this in in Poland in 2021 2022 but um, of course, we were also interested in, you know, in the situation in Germany and UK. Germany doesn't have, you know, a far right government yet, um, we have to say. Um, but the the alternative for Germany, the AFD, is, um, is still, you know, they're gaining power um, and they're also... Um, part of most of the local and the state parliaments. And they also take on posts there, they take on resp responsibilities there. And the AFD is often given the responsibility for the cultural committee because, yeah. you know, most of the other parties argue that, you know, that's, that's the kind of committee where they can do the least damage. Um, and this in turn has, of course, drastic consequences for public, publicly funded institutions like museums, 
Um, and especially those institutions with few resources, fewer staff. Um, if we look at our interviews, the interviews that we did comparatively, we can see um, a very distinct set of practices uh, with which um, these parties and agents attempt to disrupt uh, museum activities. Um, so in terms of content, um, the, the, the far right agenda is all about emphasizing the, the local history, history of the homeland, um, a positive, a proud view of our past, um, uh, you know, our great past, our glorious past. Um, um, so, you know, it's very clearly a nationalist, uh, ethnically homogenous versions of the past that are here presented as great and that, you know, exclude, of course, anything that could be described as, you know, difficult or mm. that has to do with the colonial history as, you know, as Jana <laughs> just illustrated so well. So these, this, this set of practices in practice includes... Uh, the cutting of budgets, um, the replacement of museum directors, the direct appointment of new directors, um, also forms of harassment, um, of threats, um, of you have to say something like, you know, very targeted campaigns against persons, um, you know, with um, means of, you know, filming people, posting um photos of people um working in museums and doing uh, exhibitions um publishing the addresses of people in these uh, telegram groups and stuff like that um these disruptions happen when museums um do anything that promotes equality diversity social pluralism um for example, when it comes to topics such as migration, um, topics such as racism, uh, when museum uses gender equitable language or when museums and the exhibition focus on colonial history, slavery in the UK, for example. Um, so this has, of course, you know, the, the consequences are important here because um, people who are um affected like the like this they are intimidated often um people become discouraged insecure um you know you you are you, you it's fear is something that is happening um and also not fear but still like anticipation of you know it getting worse or the worst scenario um this in turn leads, and this was something that worries us very much, um, um, this can lead to something like a reduction or cancellation of certain events in the museum, or it can lead to reduction of certain, you know, form of public event or public relations work. It can also lead to reduction of, you know, work that is something like commitment even beyond the museum or you know, some sort of political engagement. Um, if e a museum even gets like a query, the AFD has the strategy where they, you know, just attack a museum with, you know, a bunch of queries about, you know, the, the museum's finances and, you know, um, even if they just get that, you know, which is not that bad but it still means that um it just takes time you know it takes time of your usual work yeah. time gets wasted on filling out these queries and responding to yeah. you know senseless you know these irritating questions by afd politicians yeah. um can i ask you before also we uh, yeah. move on to Gorenka. Um, I think we can understand the toll this is having on museum professionals uh personal life as well, not just the professional, their mental health. Yes. And we know that in Germany, uh, you founded an association with the mm -hmm. purpose of supporting these professionals. What kind of support have you given? Can you give? Can you talk to us briefly about it? Of course. So this is kind of a byproduct of the research that we've done. So I got in touch, you know, with um, 
with people with just you know the, with the same kind of worries um and there's this you know now a smallish group of uh, people working in museums around museums and we're we yeah we're founded as an association now we have a website and um we're trying to get you know to make these incidents uh more public because often they they are not reported on you know for several reasons um um and i think it's just important to see um or to to also have it more in public that there is this like scale and that it's not just a bunch of you know singular events and incidents happening but that it's you know also this very um widespread strategic approach by the far right you know culture is not it's not a uh, something you know that just happens uh, on the side in their politics it's like it's a core mm. you know area of their concerns and um yeah it's important for us to just um you know support museums um that are attacked in some sort of way um, and we're also working together with the museum associations in Germany, mm -hmm. um, doing workshops um, and just telling people about what is happening and, you know, how people can get also how prepare their institutions and themselves and, you know, support their employees. Um, and what we also have on our website is uh, is this tool for reporting incidents so mm -hmm. you get to the website and the first thing that comes up is uh, do you want to report anything and you can do so anonymously and you know it's our job to kind of like collect these incidents and um and just yeah tell people about what's happening and um we're doing it anonymously because you know sometimes there are reasons for not telling you know anybody beyond the institution what has been happening um so yeah we think it's important to you know just have the option to do it anonymously as well and i can post the the link to the website i was going to say yeah if you want yeah, to it's only in in german yeah, we heard. Yeah, yeah, we'll try to translate a bit. Thank yeah. you so much, Julia. So, Goranka, uh, Intercom has been involved in the Museum Watch Government Management Project. Uh, uh, I've read that one of the particular concerns of the project is the increase in political interference in museums and having in mind now also the statement of Nemo. What is your overview? You are traveling a lot. You talk to a lot of our colleagues in different countries. Where do we stand at this point? Well, thank you. Uh, Intercom has, in fact, uh, recently uh, started several research project, uh, projects. One was on leadership, uh, a global survey, uh, the first of that kind and results were published also in a pub publication taking the pulse uh, while parallelly we did this uh, museum watch uh, governance project with simam uh, also CIMAM, yes. at some uh, directors forums uh, globally uh, so we organized some in south america in africa southeast europe Southeast Asia, uh, just to see the uh, special uh, uh, needs of the museum professionals in those regions. And uh, uh, at the moment, we are preparing for the next triennial, the topic of advocacy for museums, which we think is really uh, uh, crucial uh, in order to secure sustainability of our institutions. Well, uh, with CIMAM, uh, the project uh, was somehow connecting these two aspects. Uh, their initiative, Museum Watch, this is a platform they started online uh, with the idea that museums can uh, uh, report on uh, breaches of professional standards and practice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, what is interesting for Intercom, how governance is actually uh, put into operation in different uh, uh, countries, because governance somehow, you know, uh, mm -hmm. overwhelms everything a museum does. Uh, it mm -hmm. actually 
is not only um, something that deals with museum mission, purpose, vision, but also gives an insight how things are organized, how uh, museums are directed and controlled, because mm -hmm. the, the very term of government governance means that there is a kind of control to some extent. Uh, we are all public uh, institutions, and of course, um, uh, there has to be transparency and good practice connected uh, with museums, uh, and uh, they should be, uh, uh, how to say, um, uh, presenting their results, their impacts, their uh, uh, what they do, and how they manage to uh, help the society to uh, be a better and more prosperous one. However, uh, when we started uh, the project, we uh, talked with our researchers. Uh, we had two uh, uh, researchers outside ICOM, Ian King and Anik Schrame. And uh, we focused mainly on Southeast Europe and East uh, Europe uh, because uh, uh, there were numerous reports on mispractices in these uh, uh, countries, although I must say that uh, when you scratch under the surface, uh, there are a lot of similar things in the western part uh, of Europe. Just when I talked to some of our colleagues and, for example, in Netherlands or in UK, are you independent? Oh, yes, we are, but who is in our board? Oh, they just appointed an old uh, politician to our board. So uh, we uh, wanted to see this tripartite uh, uh, governance model, founder, board of trustees, and the director, how they manage together, and what is the influence, actually. Uh, what we wanted to see uh, is whether there is a kind of opportunity to have, a, how to say, to... Uh, to put into practice a code of governance for mm -hmm. all these bodies. Uh, because we all have, especially in Southeast Europe, we are a very regulated uh, uh, area. Uh, this Austro-Hungarian impact has left traces. And so we have museum laws, uh, bylaws, uh, dealing with every every uh, uh, part of museum work. But what is the problem is the implementation. Uh, the laws in itself are not uh, actually bad. They are covering uh, uh, all aspects that are important for museums. They put forward the standards. But when you come to the operational plans, when you come to funding, then you see that uh, uh, many yeah. things are not implemented. You can see it also uh, um, uh, when we analyzed uh, the uh, the budgets of museums uh, mm -hmm. from managerial point of view, the numbers don't lie. So when you when you uh, have uh, the ratio of expenses spent on museums, you see how uh, much is uh, uh, money is given to a certain kind of pro uh, programs. Uh, what we also wanted to uh, see is how independent um, board of trustees and how independent director museum directors are. Uh, we actually uh, uh, saw that in many countries, uh, the directors of uh, most public museums, if they are national, they are appointed by the minister. Uh, if they are uh, local or regional museums, then they are appointed by the county perfect or by the mayor. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and in recent years, we noticed that this change, when the change of government happens, then uh, uh, the directors of the former uh, uh, government have to go. So yeah. this is not only, I would like to say, stress that is, this is not only a far-right uh, practice, this is also when 
uh, uh, leftish governments come into into power. So, for example, we had a very significant uh, example from Slovenia. So every four years, uh, you had changes in government, and so the directors were going uh, off and on. What is the problem mm -hmm. also is that the boards uh, in uh, our regions are also appointed by the uh, uh, government, mm. uh, the, the majority of the board, and the minority of the board comes from the employees. So the director has actually, uh, uh, how to say, has to balance between uh, uh, being on good terms with both uh, important stakeholders Actually, it is very difficult when you are in charge in your institutions to the persons who are actually the members of your uh, of your board and appoint you. Mm. And on the other hand, uh, those external members are usually appointed from the colleagues, from the museum directors. So mm. these are not the persons who are uh, uh, professionally ignorant uh, about yeah. the DM needs, but they are depending on uh, their uh, respective governments. Uh, so they will never, how to say, uh, push uh, mm. forward the issues of greater controversy. Uh, we used for our research uh, several uh, uh, several uh, models. Uh, several, the methodology consisted of a questionnaire, uh, which was anonymous, so people can have uh, more or less free answers. And then we uh, used uh, focus groups uh, so that people can personally uh, mm -hmm. state uh, what, uh, what is uh, the problem for them. Um, are these results available? Are they have yes, been they published? Yes, they are available. They are available in English. Okay. The Intercom website or somewhere else? Oh. I shouldn't have asked that question. <laughs> Let's see if Goranka gets back to us. Okay. Are you there? Maybe uh, as we wait for Goranka to come back, there is a question that is really at the tip of my tongue as I'm listening to all your experiences and everything you've shared with us. Uh, Jana, going back to you, um, how lonely did it feel for you and for your colleagues once the attacks started? And do you think you got the support you needed? Mm. It, it felt very overwhelming. Mm -hmm. um, not all so much lonely because we're, we are also a bigger team mm -hmm. at the museum. So, so we had each other, okay. um, although it wasn't that easy, of course. Yeah. Um, of course, in the beginning it felt lonely, but we, um, I think on day two or three, we already had people writing us who had had similar experiences and you okay. know, were supporting us and saying, okay, it, you have to know that it, um, that it will blow over at some point, you know, that was, um, yeah. um, a good thing to know and to, to hear from someone who had experienced it. Yeah. Um, yeah, but it felt very overwhelming because all of a sudden you didn't know whom to trust. Um, and of course, in such a big organization, you know that not everyone is supporting you. And of course, we also had the problem that um, people were hiding behind this safer space time slot or behind the discussion if a safer space is really a good idea, you know, to... Mm -hmm. um, to get to uh, into talking about the topic and um we made the experience that um, some were hiding behind that to say okay we can't say or we can't support you because that would mean that we would support safer spaces and that's already like a heated topic and um yeah. not something um, that everyone can agree on but of course that was yeah. also part of the exhibition workshop to discuss if such a format was helpful and in the way that we 
um, that we used it. So mm. that was already up for discussion because we are open to talking about it and everyone involved was. But that what made it um, more complicated um, mm -hmm. because people also, the other political parties that are also um, are involved in this regional assembly, um, they also, you know, could wait it to, to put out a statement or something. Um, yeah. But of course, we also have we have the cultural department and the head of our cultural department. She was very supportive and um, was trying to get people to react. Um, and we also had um, people or organizations react, but it took some time. So yeah, mm. it felt very lonely in the beginning, and the reactions were very differently depending on who you ask. Because we always were very transparent about what we were doing within the exhibition workshop. And we also had a um, regular regular meetings with the cultural depart department where we were, had to report, you know, what we are doing. And um, I think everyone was always like, yeah. oh, that's great what you're doing, good job. And everyone I think was content yeah. that they didn't have to deal with the topic of colonialism because it's also yeah. um, related to a lot of heated debates. Yeah. Um, but we could say, okay, we are always transparent about what we're doing also with the safer space time slots. So it wasn't like we, um, we did it on our own. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but it was kind of like okay. a boomerang at some point. We have about a quarter of an hour left. So as we have, uh, we are joined by many colleagues from different parts of the world. Uh, please feel free to turn your cameras and microphones on to make your comments or questions to our guests. If you prefer, you can use the chat. So just let us see you and hear you. Nobody is coming with an immediate question. Maybe, <laughs> let's see. There, hello. Is it me you're saying hello to? Yes, I am. Oh, hello. You were the um, first to appear. Do you have a comment or a question? <laughs> um, yes, um, I'm. my name is Darling Clover and I'm from Canada. Um, and I work a lot with uh, women's and gender museums. And so, um, yeah. <laughs> the backlash but I, I mean I don't really have a question I, it was you know so beautifully articulated everything I just want to say that what you're doing is so important because if it weren't there would be no backlash if it, when you do something that's completely irrelevant no one responds to it it's fine it just goes along so while in the midst of the chaos, um, and I have been in the midst of it myself, it does feel, um, you know, Jenna, you've so beautifully said, you know, how, how destabilizing and disrupting and frightening and, and, and all of you have said it is. Just remember that what you're doing is really, really powerful, which is why it's attracting that attention. So um, in, in, you know, very much in solidarity and uh, just, just keep up what you're doing because because if you're making them mad, you're doing it right. That that was a good point. Uh, um, but do you think it is enough to remind ourselves that what we're doing is important? I'm particularly interested in the feelings involved uh, in the on the impact on our mental health, um, our families as well, because all the tactics, Yana and then Yulia. Um, shared with us, we, we know them, they're happening here, mm -hmm. everywhere. Uh, and sometimes these photos, these addresses, these phone numbers include other members of the family, um, young children many times. The, do you think you have a plan? I mean, it's also, I don't know if I can say it is predictable how they're going to react, what they're going to do. Do you think we are ready? We have a plan to deal with that? And to protect our colleagues. And um, I, you know, are you asking me? Everyone. I so I, please, yes. Panelist, maybe the panel. No, 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 no. Everybody, um, everybody, okay. please. Um, yeah, I'll let uh, I'll let uh, Jana speak. I, I'm um, or or uh, or Julia or yeah. Yeah. So our guests and because, well, if um, I if I can if I can add something, yeah. uh, we have. Uh, in the middle of the renewing ICOM's code of ethics. And we put governance and um, uh, the ethical approach and governance into mm. this new draft. So this yeah. is something new. 
we think that if uh, the global museum organization somehow uh, puts it uh, more prominently into their basic documents, it mm. can also be a good tool for museum people worldwide to use it. Yeah, thank you, Goranka. Yes. Uh, Jana, Julia, any comments? Yeah, I think, yeah, I think we, we are in the process of being better prepared. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's a huge topic throughout the whole museum year as well, because there have been so many conferences um, in Germany as well. Um, we also had our own conference, which was taking, talking about like taking a firm stand. Yeah. Um, and we, of course, have also been presenting our example at conferences, you know, what we learned from it. Of course, there are also a lot of other in institutions that have already been attacked. So that's a huge topic. I think the um, the problem is to get everyone together talking about it and to um, to develop um, guidelines um, which are really easy to follow mm -hmm. so that also smaller museums especially can be prepared you know because we were in the comfortable position that we um, are a really huge museum with our different sites and you know we already feel more protected although I don't know how you know um, if it really is like that but it feels a little bit um better maybe than if you're working in the small museum um but of course sometimes it seems so obvious you know what is important it's important that if you you have good networks um that you um uh, that you know who is having your back that you before you start a project um, and i don't mean depending you know um deciding on whether to have a project on that based on that but it really helps if you know, um, you know, who is taking a firm stand and who is having your back within the project. And it's really good to talk about that beforehand, what you can expect um, and, you know, maybe also have it in writing, which would be helpful at some point to react much quicker. Um, in the within the networks that you have, you should be really clear about if a, if a crisis appears, how they will react on social media and whatever. Um, and how that can look and maybe already have that prepared. Um, then again, also prepare yeah. communication. Um, and we already started doing that, but we didn't mm. do it um, on the level of social media to have those really short informations because we were talking about colonialism and that's a very difficult topic. And to break that down onto this level of social media to be able to respond to certain comments also on, a, um, on the content level, Mm -hmm. um, that was really um, took us some time, um, yeah. and also you have your employees prepared for situations. You know, not um, not to be able to talk about the content of a topic, but to be able to moderate like a situation to um, that you get into, and that always um, you know concerns hate speech or people yeah. trying to distract you from I don't know a guided tour or something. But that you have trained those kind of situations, and that's what we did a lot after the incident okay. um, that you can rely on yourself that you remember your training when you get into this situation so we also mm. did that a lot but i think the crucial thing is to really talk about that um those incidents and um how you can react to them and to really be able to connect and exchange the expertise and then get into action about it yeah. you know to have yes. those checklists ready to have those networks ready um, and I think that's where we have to do a lot of work still. And um, we have to be very open about what we are doing maybe and within the, those museum networks, um, because I know that there already have been a lot of people working on that, but to find those documents and those guidelines when you are in a crisis, well, yeah. it's really hard. And I think the crucial thing is to, um, if you're working on something, to really promote it through all the museum networks um, so that everyone can benefit from it. That's great. So many things you shared with us, Jana. Thank you. Julia, Goranka, anything you would like to add? Um, I second everything that Jana just said, and I can just um, add um, that I think the most important thing is, you know, to to be together, to, you know, to learn and know what's going on um, and also not shy away from everything, you know, from anything that's um, because um as was just said these are the important topics that trigger the far right right so we just have to keep up with with that and then the other thing is to also be aware that 
you know, people in working in museums are, you know, not the first or the only ones, you know, being the target of far right campaigns and attacks. Um, and it, you know, this affects so many people and so many groups, um, which is also, you know, ample opportunity to to get in touch, to network, you know, to form these nets of solidarity beyond the museum. And also there are so many, so many groups, so many organizations and networks and initiatives, you know, working and fighting against the rise of the right. And it's that's, you know, that's actually pretty amazing. And, you know, mm -hmm. it gives gives me hope also. Yeah, know your allies. <laughs> One of the and, things uh, the people mentioned uh, is also how to say to to go uh, into media, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, somehow uh, make uh, all these problem problems public. Yeah. Uh, this is something that is helpful and uh, really uh, how to say because uh, all the politicians are are afraid of this how this will be presented uh, mm. uh, on TV, in newspapers. And uh, so these alliances with, of course, responsible and respectful uh, journalists is also important for yeah. the welfare of the museums. And yes, of course. Thank you, Goranka. So I'll go back to the colleagues who are with us. Uh, anybody who would like to make a comment or a question? Yeah, Artemis is saying that she had the same questions about whether museum professionals feel alone or outnumbered by this growing far-right majority. Are they a majority? What do you think? Nope. I don't think they are the majority. Uh, none of the extremes are actually majority, but they are given uh, too much voice and uh, space. This is the problem. And, uh, you know, the, I don't know who said that the problem are not the extre extremists, but the silent majority. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Jessica has added on the chat, they're a loud minority, very loud indeed. Okay, anything you would like to add before we finish our conversation? And I would like to thank you again very much for accepting this invitation. Final thoughts. I would just like to thank you, Maria, for, you know, organizing this event and also the series. I think, you know, this is um, a very important part of uh, everything that we just talked about. And mm -hmm. um, thank you so much for this. Thank you. Yes, I also wanted to thank you because, um, yeah, really, really enjoyed this. And I also want to say uh, that a lot of positive things came out of this um, right wing shitstorm as well, because Mm. We have much more visitors. We are very visible with our project. And every time I go into the exhibition, there is someone there. It's a much younger um, audience as well. and um, But also older people staying like for one or two hours within the exhibition. And it's um, a really a great outcome of that because you um, are now able to talk to people. There are a lot of guided tours that are being booked because everyone is really interested in the topic. So there's also a positive thing that, that came out of that. That's, there's a lot of more a lot more conversation about the topic that we wanted to come back to. Great. I would also like to thank you. And I have put in the chat the link uh, that uh, leads to our website. Great. Free publication. Great. Thank you. And if more people would like to turn their cameras on at this point, just before we close, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, Somebody is asking whether you can find the recording. It's nice to see you all. Uh, we'll put it soon on our uh, YouTube channel and you'll get an email with a link uh, if you want to, uh, to see it, to listen to it again. So that's it. Thank you so much. Have a good rest and see you soon again. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Marie. you so much.